So what do wildlife need? Obviously they need food, cover, and water. I usually leave out water off uh, any of my concerns, unless you get a summer like this. Uh, water is usually not much of an issue. Uh, they'll either find it on the property or they'll utilize it out of the food uh, that they eat. And uh, there's a lot of metabolic, metabolic water in foods. Uh, so your primary things you've got to be concerned about is food and cover. As Mark also said, most of the time food's not that much of an issue. Although we need to be managing for food, uh, cover is typically the one of the various types of cover is typically the one that uh, is limiting on, on critters. Uh, I use this slide just to kind of indicate um, there, there's a mindset among especially deer hunters and managers. Uh, acorns are, you know, the utopia for deer. Um, you know, deer love acorns. That's all they like to eat is acorns. The problem with acorns is it's a three or four month seasonal food. The cover thing is the main thing to be concerned about. There's so many different forms of it. Um, from depending on which species you're talking about, you're talking about quail, you got brood cover, you got nesting cover, you got protective cover, winter cover, summer cover. Uh, turkey's the same thing. For deer, you've got fawning cover is important, very important. Um, and and uh, and you got you know protective cover when they're field harassed, and, and uh, so there's a lot of different forms of cover. My philosophy is understory is the name of the game in wildlife management. Um, there's a trade-off from the timber standpoint. There's no doubt about it. We'll talk about that a little bit too. But uh, to grow this understory, just like a garden, it's all sunlight driven. You know, doesn't need fertilizer, so it's fairly cheap. This needs to be maintained with some burning and things like that, or herbicides. And uh, but it is what runs the system uh, from a wildlife management standpoint. This is the trade-off. So canopy closure is the name of the game in that case. Um, you can't grow these understories you're looking to try and grow without uh, some form of sunlight. Uh, it uh, you know, has a whole lot to do with the timber management aspect as well. If you're trying to grow timber, these trees still need sunlight as well. So a tree like this, you can see how tight that crown is. It's being shaded by this tree here, being shaded by this tree, being shaded by this tree, this tree, and certainly this tree. So that crown's real tight and small. And of course, this isn't a hardwood stand, but the concept's the same. It'll grow uh, at a good rate. So, loggers are our friends. Um, they, uh, just about every landowner I work with hates to see these things moving in. Uh, a couple thousand pound pieces of equipment on rubber tires running around, skidding trees all over the place, uh, breaking things, tearing up things like having the military in on your property. And, uh, but there's a definite benefit to it. There's a good example also on the property we were going to look at this afternoon. We'll give you a field tour here on the uh, slideshow. <clears throat> this is a pine plantation, um, fairly well stocked, 600 trees per acre or so, plus or minus. There's probably still there's probably some more than that. Uh, had good survival. You can see all the definitive rows running straight down. No wildlife habitat other than the fact that deer or turkeys might walk through it. Turkey might scratch around in those pine needles down there and find a grub or two. But uh, that's about it. There's just nothing for a critter out there. But the rows are well defined. Uh, it's an old field plantation. It was playing on a field at one point in time. And uh, here's the, the various options. Um, this is actually the same stand uh, after it was planted this past summer. And uh, standard, what, they call, what I call standard forestry thin, 250 trees per acre, somewhere in that, of residual uh, trees left on that stand. It was a fifth row thin. So this row was taken out, thank you. Um, four rows remaining standing, and then another row taken out, four rows remaining standing, another row taken out. So it's fifth row thin. Uh, that clear cuts 20% of the stand right off the back. When you take those every fifth row, that's 20% of your stand being pulled out. This is the other end of the spectrum. The, uh, this was a landowner that uh, wanted to thin back to quail woods on the first thin and uh, take a 600 tree per acre stand. Actually, it was probably a little less than that. It was more like 500 because it had a whole lot of hardwood growing into the stand. Uh, but we went in and took out everything except the last 100 trees per acre. This is a good uh, kind of a compromise. This leans a little bit more on the wildlife end, but you know, it's kind of a compromise between the two. Uh, uh, 130, 140 trees per acre. So, you know, you look at what he's selling on these things, talked about the selection on them. Um, you get these natural pines, 
you have a real high variance in size, classes, and species. Um, heterogeneous stand. It's, uh, you know, you got a big tree and a small tree, and a crooked tree and a straight tree, and a carnarsonite tree and a, and a clean tree. You got a fork tree and, and another straight tree. It's, it, it's real variable through the stand. And uh, so you also then end up with a high variance in products on these natural stands. You might get a bunch of uh, fine pulp wood, you get some chip and saw, some can of wood, you know, just off, a, uh, off an individual thin. There might be a whole lot of products coming out. Pine plantations, these are pretty simple and straightforward. Almost all the trees, but the trees have a lot more uh, similarity from tree to tree. This is a second thin uh, in this stand. They typically, you know, you'll want to mark them. Uh, it's not always the case. Uh, in this particular case, there was a lot of variability. Uh, you can see even just right in here, a lot of variability in the size and, uh, and certainly uh, fusiform, fork tops, damage, things like that. This was a stand that uh, we had thinned. It was a CRP stand. Uh, that we originally thin to what CRP would allow you to thin down to, which was 200 trees per acre. And cut it down to about 75 trees per acre on the second thin. And in this particular case, you can see what's going on over here, the long leaf strips, things like that, quail field. This is primarily quail oriented. It's still a fairly high density from a quail standpoint, 75 trees per acre, especially in the size class, because they'll shade out fairly quick. But again, Avoiding that risk of thinning it too hard the first time. You can stand them up, but you can't make them grow after they're cut. Um, so this is kind of, at least from a, um, a balancing act of the wildlife timber and things, this is kind of what you're shooting for. Um, all right, so we'll talk about burning. Um, uh, again, we talk about kind of what we do. This is one of those cases where... You know, we don't go out there and tell landowners, well, you need to burn this, you don't need to burn that, uh, and then walk away. We're typically, in most cases, the ones who actually light fires and, and uh, keep them modern ones. But there's there's not much more of a, a better technique that you can impact a lot of acres um, over a fairly short period of time for a fairly reasonable cost. Uh, burning works real well, but all, always it's going to be better with thinning. So... Fire stimulating these wildlife plants uh, in the woodlands. This is the things we're shooting for. Legumes, this plant right here, this plant right here, you carry the same protein level as you would be carrying in a cowpea patch. Um, and, and that's without fertilization or anything else. It may not be exactly the same. These might, the cowpeas might be 32%, these might be 30%. But in the growing tips of this vegetation, you can see where the deer have been browsing on a plant like this. And the growing tips of this vegetation is still that high percentage protein and high digestible nutrients that a cow pea patch would have. The difference is if you've got 90 acres of it versus 10 acres of cow peas, you're talking about a lot of forage out there on, on a burned woodlands. Native warm season grasses also uh, strongly uh, stimulated by regular burning, keeps the competition. These are not really competitive plants for shade and or for ground space. So the burning removes that competition, allows these things to spread. Uh, the summer burning, uh, growing season fires, <clears throat> also have strong use. Um, and we, you know, I think our last burn we did was uh, about three weeks ago, um, maybe a month ago, before it really, really started getting bad dry. Uh, when it starts getting that dry, you're just afraid not only burning your stuff off, but a couple, three of your neighbors. And uh, so... This was a uh, uh, May burn, late April, uh, May burn on a place. I could have made money off this besides the burn itself by betting the landowner that I could burn his quail woods in the summertime. He just would not believe that once the woods greened up that we could run a fire through there. And his problem was, like a lot of folks, um, <clears throat> he had a really strong understory of sweet gums in this open quail woods. And... Uh, he didn't want to spend the money, 50, 60 bucks an acre to spread sweet gums out of it. And uh, so we said, well, we can burn it late. He said, well, you can't burn after, you know, greens up after the first of April, you know, you're done. And uh, we said, yeah, you, you can burn this stuff because when you look at it, you still got lots of dead thatch on the ground. Just because it's green doesn't mean it's not going to burn. Dead thatch fuel is still out there. And, uh, and so we can knock these gums back down to the ground every couple of years with a summer burn. Mulchers, another option, uh, understory clearing. A lot of times these gums, you, you're looking at trying to control gum stands uh, in a pine stand, 
and get them out. Um, and if, you, if they're not big enough, when you have to do a thinning operation for the loggers, remove them four inches or, or more, unless you're running a chip and crude uh, that can fuel with those things. Uh, a lot of cases when you get these bigger gums, you have to come in with a, with a mulch machine and just flat bow the bigger stuff. You can go down through a stand real quick and just touch it up, clean up behind loggers or whatever, and knock down the, the uh, leaners and fork, the, the, the snapped over trees, things like that, run them down, uh, get the gums that the loggers couldn't get, and, and get those down on the ground so that when you think or when you spray, your gums are in that three, four, five foot height class, and you do a good job of a hand crew uh, to spray over top of them. But these are very efficient machines, do a heck of a job on cleaning up. Uh, making a, a logging operation look nice after it's done or cleaning up understories and get sweet gums off of, off an understory and get them ready to spray. This is an example, and it's more hardwood oriented um, uh, compared to the pine we're supposed to be talking about, but it relates to this understory clearing work. This was uh, actually on that property we were going to do our field tour on. We did a uh, kind of hardwood savanna, opened up some hardwood stands. Uh, you know, again, the landowner wanted deer hunting here, and you know, you sit in the stand and not see anything. It was just a lot of hardwood junk, some little bit of pine growing through here, but lots of little young sapling uh, gum, junky oak trees, post oak, things like that. And we wanted to kind of create that more open condition in the hardwood forest where we could retain it with uh, fire. So we took some of these series pictures. This is a good tree to keep an eye on. And you can tell we already made one pass with a mulcher through here before I got this picture done. Uh, but anyway, this is a, a pre-picture before really anything got done. That was after. Of course, it was in the wintertime versus summertime. But uh, that's the same tree right here. And there's the flag. That was after we did the mulching work in the summer. Everything greened up. Got all the saplings and the junk out of there. Had a lot of uh, sapling hardwood and shrubs coming back, which we sprayed. And then followed it up with a burn, same tree with the flag behind it, followed up with a burn the winter after. You see how much more open it is right off the bat, though. And the landowner loves it. He's got a field over there where he can sit and watch the field. But typically, probably 60 to 70 percent of the deer he sees is in this, walking through the woods, not standing on a field, uh, which I always find fascinating. I mean, once we rely on green fields uh, for deer hunting anymore, but the last day I deer hunted this year, I saw 40 something deer. Five of those were in a green field. All 30, 30 uh, something remaining deer were all walking through either woods like this or, or open fresh long leaves. So, uh, anyway, it's interesting how they utilize these woods. This is again the summer after that, after the burn, and we'd already sprayed all the junk out. So, this is kind of the look that we ended up with. Just very clean, pretty underneath, uh, easy to hunt, something you can see off in the distance. Uh, herbicides, I'll cover the herbicide thing a little bit more. Uh, uh, when we're going to this next talk, but that's a pre-picture. Uh, herbicides are going to be spraying over here, and uh, that's after. Got the sweet gum out.